The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning. Special welcome to anyone who's visiting today. We're glad to have you here with us and hope you'll be blessed and encouraged in our time of worship. Uh, <clears throat> prayer and praise, the first annual <coughs> prayer and praise service was rich, so it is going to continue. And thank you all for who were a part of that and sharing testimony. And the pie was fantastic. We got great uh, cooks in this church. So let's continue that and try to outdo it each year is my goal. The turkey bowl, uh, we had some crazies show up and play in all of that snow. And I was blessed of God. I hurt my back shoveling, so I got to miss the turkey bowl. First time in 21 years, and it felt really good to eat turkey without the smell of Ben Gay in my nostrils. So, well, this morning is a special Lord's Day as we're going to corporately come to the Lord's table and remember the sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the great gifts that Jesus inaugurated for his bride was on the, the night in which he was betrayed, uh, he, ordinate, he brought this ordinance to pass. And so I've always said, while mankind was at their very worst, uh, God was at his very best in redeeming a people for himself. And so today we are going to corporately remember the sacrificial death of our Savior. Therefore, what I'd like to do this morning is prepare our hearts for the table and with that aim that it would be a means of grace to every believing heart here this morning. So let's go to our God and ask him to do that very thing. Father, we come to you and we pray that it would uh, be a means of grace as we open the word of God, as we partake and remember what you have done for us. May every heart be inflamed with love to you as we return and set our sole focus on our first love. And so God, for any wandering hearts, for any declension in spirituality that has taken place, I pray that this morning would be a time of renewal and restoration, God, that you would meet us here at the table and that you would do wonderful things as we just remember the glories of our Christ. So we pray and ask this of you, God, this morning. And through Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 14, I think this might be the first sermon ever preached for the communion table from Romans 14. Uh, but I, I just felt led of God. That's where we needed to be. And, and in a decade, we're actually going to get to this chapter in our study through Romans. So I'm going to give you a little preclude, you know, prelude to look at it first. So Paul's going to teach us uh, in the area of sanctification, how do we deal with differences in the church? And the issues he's going to address are that of conscience issues, what we call Christian liberty. We have commands in the scriptures that we are all to obey. We have these principles that are driven from scripture that we're to obey. And we have these things called conscience issues where there's really no moral issue at stake, meaning that neither one is sin. So it's the freedom of the believer to choose how he wants to work out his salvation in these areas. And surprisingly to me, over the years, these issues can cause more problems in the unity of the Spirit in the body of Christ than any other issues. We, we like black and white commandments. It's easy to unify on those things. But this is where it gets difficult. So on this Communion Sunday, I would like to open this up and let God's Word have its way in our hearts and then come to the Lord's table uh, fully unified in these areas. I kind of made a commitment to preach on this about every five years, and I'm, I missed it. So we're going to come back to Romans 14, and I'm just going to ask you for, to, to look at God's Word, and maybe you need to repent before God this morning at the table if you've let your heart drift in some of these areas of how we treat one another on these differences. So let's set the context quickly, which I'll be doing in January, so I don't want to get too bogged down, but Romans is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. This gospel has the, the power of God to bring us into the realm of salvation. And then Paul flushes it out beautifully. And he shows us the glories and the beauties of this gospel and how he can bring sinners back to God. And then he gets to Romans chapter 12 with that beautiful, therefore, 
In light of this gospel, I urge you to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to God. And so we are to learn how to live out this great salvation that God has given us in Christ. The, the response is, because of these mercies, God, here's my life. I offer it up to you, a living sacrifice. What does it look like? And Romans 12 through 16 is what does it look like? How do we work this out, what God has worked within us by his spirit? And it starts in Romans 12 with renewing the mind and thinking God's thoughts about him and life. And then he's going to move into, we have to think new thoughts about the body of Christ in our life together. And then he's going to move into Romans 13, verse 8. <clears throat> Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So the fulfillment of all that God wants from you is to love God and to love other people. That's been the message since we started this church because it's the message of God. And so how do we love our neighbors as ourself in conscience issues where we differ and think different on these? How do we love each other as the whole context? How does the body of Christ stay in this oneness and love and unity as we journey with differences? And so many times love gets thrown out in these areas very quickly. We get gnarly. We get self-righteous. Self-righteousness is death on these issues. We get judgmental and we get prideful. And we break the unity of the spirit for our little conscience issues and our, our little soapboxes and what we want to proclaim and let everybody else know we're right. And we'll destroy the beauty of the unity of what we have in Jesus Christ. So the burning question in my heart is how do I love the body of Christ on conscience issues? And I want to survey Paul's answer, but one quick comment. You'll remember back when I preached to Ephesians. <clears throat> when Paul got done laying out the beauties of the gospel and he had a therefore, the longest section Paul had now on working out your salvation was what? Do you remember? To, to live worthy of the calling that you've received. And he spent a whole chapter on the unity of the Spirit and how we work that out. That was the burning passion of Paul's heart is that we maintain the unity of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Now in Romans... Therefore, live, offer your body a living sacrifice. And he spends two verses on developing the Christian mind. He spends six verses on spiritual gifts and how they function in the body. He spends 13 verses on how to love without hypocrisy in, in the body of Christ. It's a beautiful section. He spends seven verses on how the church and state function. He spends three verses on the summary of the whole law that I just read. He spends four verses on right conduct in light of the return of Jesus Christ. And he spends 35 verses on accepting each other on these liberty conscience issues. It's, it's this long, drawn-out section once again. Do you think this means something to God? That this is always the longest section of how you lived your life as children of God? You think it might be weighty and big to the Apostle Paul and God? If this is not weighty to your heart... You're missing a huge part of how you're to live the Christian life and why it is important to God. And so let's take a look together <coughs> at Romans 14. I'm sorry, I'm on the tail end of a cold and I took a bunch of cold medicine. You guys look really funny this morning. <laughs> and if I'm not making sense, that's the way it feels to me right now. So I just pray that <coughs> it does. So flip on that chart if you would. <coughs> this is my attempt to try to give us an overview of Romans 14. And so this is really cool. I drew a little picture. Laura snapped a picture of it, sent it to Julie DeCryfe, and Julie DeCryfe made this, and now Robert Watson got it, and it just pops up like that. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? So I want you to notice the heading, Christian Liberty, and don't miss this. This is not commandments. These are conscience issues and how we deal with issues that don't have a, a morality to the left or to the right. And I want you to come and look at this little plateau at the top. 
And the plateau is where we want to land our plane in the Christian life. And I want you to see then that there are two ways to fall off the plateau. <clears throat> One is with legalism. And legalism of, of the law of I'm going to get right with God and accept it by keeping the law. And then I, I'm going I'm to have more issues. This is how I get accepted by God as a Christian. And you've got to keep these rules and all of these things. And you, you continue to just be legalistic. And this is not where Paul wants us to land. He's been laboring in Romans. Do not fall in legalism. It will damn you. It will destroy you. Okay? The other one is don't fall off on the other side of what we call licentiousness. And this is your flesh is at the center of all your freedom. All it is is I'm just free to do whatever I want to do. If I want to do it, I do it. And that's all that matters. I got liberty. I got freedom. And you miss everything that Paul's going to lay out in this chapter. So to fall on that side is you're going to shipwreck your faith. I can just do anything. I'm licentious. I forget law. I just, I'm, I'm free in Christ. And you'll go just indulge in sin and not think rightly about these issues. So those are the two areas we do not want to fall into as a church. But we want to land on the plateau. <clears throat> and I want you to notice on the plateau, there are two kinds of people described. They are weak and strong faith. And so the first thing I want you to notice is both have faith, <clears throat> both have justification, what Paul has labored for five chapters to show. They've all come to believe in Christ alone for their acceptance with God. They have looked to the cross and the work of Jesus Christ for their final acceptance with God. So strong and weak Christians both are justified before God. They're both children of God. Uh, they're, they're accepted by God. So please do not miss that crucial point. And the church will always have these two kinds of groups that must live together in harmony on these issues. So we, we've got strong and weak faith, and you're going to have to be able to get along with one another in the church of God. And so because we have these issues, the command is in uh, Romans 14.1 and Romans 15.7, the only command here is to accept one another. So Paul never even tells you who's right, who's wrong. All Paul's concerned about is that you make your conscience issues well, and he's going to show us a system of how you conclude how you should live before him. But the, the biggest concern is that you uh, welcome one another, that you receive one another. So why so much time on this, Paul? It just seems simple to me. And it tells me that there, there must be a lot of remaining flesh that fights this. It shouldn't be hard. We have a real devil sowing real strife in a body, and it must then not be easy if he spends so much time on this subject. Because the whole section is amazing. He has these big answers to how we should receive one another. And so it's this, these little issues, but Paul brings up the arguments are like salvation, judgment day, the perseverance of the saints, Redemption unto the glory of God as your chief end in life and death. Love of the brotherhood and the kingdom of God. Those are the arguments he's going to bring in here. And so one man said, Paul is going to make a theological mountain out of an ethical molehill. And so these little ethical issues, he's going to undergird them with these massive doctrines of beauty and glory and his arguments. So therefore, this is really important what we're going to look at. And we're going to ask the Spirit to open up your heart to receive God's Word and let it have its way in your heart. And I want it without a fight and without defense because these issues just are so important in our little hearts. James said to receive the Word of God with humility. And so I want you to come now and open up your hearts and really let God do surgery through His Word and show you, have I fallen into sin in this area and that we would deal with it rightly. And so may we be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So uh, to me, this is so weighty. I feel like I need to ask God one more time and then we'll begin. Father, I pray now that you will come do your work in each heart individually. I pray that we would fulfill the law of God and we would love our neighbor as ourself. And so God, lead and guide us now for how we love you and how we love each other on these issues. And Lord, for anyone who's drifted, anyone who has wandered from these beautiful truths, that you would grant them the gift of repentance even this morning. And 
the refreshing that comes with that. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> One quick question. How does the world deal with differences you know, like these, cultural and ethical, and some of the decisions that we'll look at this morning is what, what they come and tell us is there's no right or wrong. Both are right. Just, you know, whatever's right to you is right. Lighten up. Don't be so opinionated. Just ease up a little bit. And the cults say we, we all agree on these issues, so there's no room for difference. They'll just, every cult just says, here's how you dress, look, act, dance, sing. They'll give you every rule so that you, you all are exactly carbon copy. That's what they do. The modern church just says, relax and love. Why do you get so uptight about these little issues? Just love one another is the answer. But what, what is probably the one thing that they would never say? Look at verse 5 of Romans 14. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be what? Fully convinced in his own mind. Isn't that the problem? If, if you, that you're too convinced in your own mind? If you have an induction with your baby. Sean Killian and his wife just did this. It's the unpardonable sin. And yet they're holding this chunky little baby who's 10 pounds and he's beautiful and it all worked out. Isn't that going to hurt the poor lady who you tell if you have an induction, you're in sin and, and just this whole falling apart. Is, isn't that our problem is we're so convicted and we're so strong on these issues that that's our, why we have so much conflict. So why would Paul say, I, I want you to be fully convinced. I want you to be dogmatic on these issues. I, I want you to get an answer and know why you believe what you believe. Doesn't that sound like it would just cause strife and conflict? And so here we are, Paul's bringing peace, and his first argument is you better be really convinced in your own mind of what you believe. So how do we do that in unity and love? And so I'm, I'm glad that you asked that question. Let's look at it. Here's your outline. <clears throat> the first, we're going to look at a general principle of Romans 14.1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And so... In Romans 15, 1, now we who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. So our general principle this morning is we have those who are weak in faith and those who are strong in faith. That's that plateau of what I showed you. So weak in faith, one thing to catch, it's not weak in, 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 the, it's not weak in faith, but it's weak in, there's a definite article, the faith. And this is not weak in their faith in Jesus Christ alone for justification, so, so how did Paul deal with that? In Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? And you know, let them be anathema if they add anything to Jesus Christ. This can't be justification. This can't be salvation issues because Paul, Paul is so dogmatic that you can't even give an inch on that. So here he's saying you can pick whichever one you want. And I'm going to show you how to get there. So I, I want you to just keep that again in your mind. <clears throat> Weak with the respect to the faith they're weak in the outworking of their faith. And so what you approve and disapprove in your Christian walk is where there's weakness. So your understanding of the gospel of grace and how I can enjoy all things that God has made for me as a child of God, how, how to work out my freedom in Christ as a believer uh, on our journey. And so really the issue that Paul is talking about, it's boiled down to this in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They had these forbidden foods, and they were called the unclean foods. They, Israel was given clean laws with kind of some purposes to keep Israel's national identity by living this way and not being drawn into the culture. But the other was they can't go into the presence of God without cleansing. And now Christ comes, and he fulfills the law, and he makes us clean and acceptable before the Father. But there were people... <clears throat> who whole, their whole lives had lived under these clean laws and rules, and it was hard to just shake it overnight. Acts 15, they had a whole Jerusalem council to kind of deal with this, and Cornelius got that vision where to let Peter know all things now are clean. And so get this. They're Christians. They're born again. They're members of the church. But they're weak in the faith. 
In verse 2, one person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. And in verse 5, one person regards one day above another, and another regards every day alike. And so he shows us what he means by the example of being weak. For now, you're, you're struggling with putting a load back on yourself, some of these clean laws, and you're, you're making the kingdom of God about some of these external things, about eating and drinking, and he'll, later Paul will say it's not about that. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so they're binding themselves under things that were not commanded by God. In fact, they had been set free from these things. And they're weak in knowing the fullness of what it means to be in Christ and then the freedom that we have in these areas. So they're, they're weak in that. And so at the outset of this verse, we can conclude the following. All Christians are not equal and identical. And what I mean is there, there are weak and there are strong sitting here this morning. They, they all have equal in regeneration and justification. That's your salvation. You're all equal. You're in Christ. You're 100% accepted by God. There's absolute equality. But in the outworking of this faith, there's not an equal being where there's some who are weaker and stronger this morning. In sanctification, John says there's babes and there's those who are mature. We grow differently. Some are weak and some are strong. Some, the theology and the outworking of it, you might be ahead of other people. And you come from different backgrounds with diverse prejudices and preferences, and you come together, and there's all this in the working out of it. So we come to, to one Christ, as uh, Austin read, one faith, one Lord, and one hope, and we're perfectly unified, but we're very different. And there's a unity of believers in light of our great diversity. And that's what I love about the Christian church. Is, is we, there's so much diversity here this morning, and we don't try to make everybody carbon copies of each other. So we're all one in Christ with very different personalities and outworkings of our faith and backgrounds and cultures, and all of these things come together, and here's how we're going to live together in, in God's kingdom. So that we're all at different places in sanctification by the grace of God and by His timing, and that is what makes the body of Christ so beautiful, is that we have each other to help grow and love and nurture each other and being strong and weak. And if you don't function this way, you'll actually start hurting each other. Where the strong will start hurting the weak and the weak will be judging the strong and all these things that will come out of it if we don't function the way God has designed this. <clears throat> so let's take a look. How should we handle this person that we're looking at then? Is he, he, he's judging us because we don't keep his list. <laughs> that, that's what's happening here. And, and I'm just going to bring, being a pastor for 30 years now, you learn certain things. And so I'm going to throw out some ideas because eating meat or not is probably not the burning issue of Southside Bible Church. I like meat, okay? I can eat it. Um, I, I've, I've been told this, that if you kiss before your wedding day, you're in sin. If you watch a Disney movie, you're supporting the gay agenda. We like choruses and, and anything but hymns are wrong. Anything but homeschooling is wrong. Tattoos are wrong. Have you ever read Leviticus? Birth control is not trusting God. You teach their kids there's a Santa Claus, and now their whole life is going to be built on a lie, and they're never going to believe the gospel because you lied to them about Santa Claus. You laugh. I've heard it. I probably said it. A Christian can only vote Republican. All secular music should not be listened to, even the 80s. <laughs> Your daughter's skirt does not go six inches below the knees. She's a modest. Alcohol will ruin your life if you drink it. And I just, I could go on and on and on. These issues are alive, well, common, and in our church even here this morning. So what do we do with someone who believes these are God's standards and judges you for not keeping them? You're not as holy as them. What do you do with that? Maybe answer that in your heart right now. What do you do with that? Well, quick note, Paul calls these people, I just want you to hear this, the weak in faith. So just start there. You usually think you're the strong one in faith, but Paul's saying you're the one who's weak in faith. So I just think that's an important place where to start, is I got to keep growing in the outworking of my faith. Because they think you're the one who's there. So how do you handle this? 
Simple. Stay away from them, right? <laughs> Don't have them over for dinner. Gossip about them. Mock them. Pray for their children. They've got to grow up under such licentious people. What do we do when we're judged in these areas of conscience? And this is where churches fall apart and they break the unity of the Spirit. Where Ephesians says, the things you're arguing over, they're, they're a gnat. <laughs> and the things you're missing are a camel called the love of God in Christ Jesus and the unity of the Spirit. That's the camel. And you're straining these little issues while you're swallowing big old camels and hurting people and sinning against them and judging them and all of these areas. This is what Paul is saying, don't do. Don't do that. So what do we do, Paul? Verse 1, accept them. Receive them. It's a very intimate word. It means to welcome them with open arms. It meant to accept one into your private circle, your family. It means to take them and get them in. Draw them close. Bring them into your personal life. <clears throat> it's the same root with a different preposition in John 14, 3. Jesus said, and I, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, same word, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I'm going to bring you into these mansions. I'm going to receive you to myself. And so I just want you to see, this is a warm-hearted reception of someone who differs with you on these issues. And so it can't be a void. Don't have them in your house. The command, the one command in this section is receive them. Bring them close. Love them. Draw, draw them near so the body can cause the growth of the body. But we're so different. He's always judging me. I, I hate to be judged. <laughs> Accept them. Okay. If you say so, Pastor, I'll bring them into my home, but I'm going to show them which way is up. And I'm going to cross-examine them. And what does he say in verse 1? Not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Don't get him close so you can show him how foolish he is and why he's wrong. That isn't the reason you bring him close. I will put him in a hermeneutical pretzel hold until he says, uncle. You can't leave till you agree. No, receive him. You don't even have to have the same conscious conviction on these issues and you can be brothers and sisters in Christ. Just love them. That's what Paul says here by the Holy Spirit. Hypocrisy. He starts chapter 12. Don't let your love have hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is you got to see everything the same way. That's a fake love. That's a false love. But the Christian, we, we can be so different than this world as we can differ on these issues and love one another. It's amazing. Can you discuss it? Yes. And the heart of it, though, is to make sure we're going to see this morning that he does it unto the Lord. It's not, I just want to make you think the way I think. I want to make sure you're doing it for the right reason. That it's all about the glory of Christ while you're making your decision. You can differ, but I care that you make it because you want to glorify Christ with your decision. If you're just doing it to be licentious or legalistic, I'm going to rebuke you. But if you're doing it for this reason, man, I, I rejoice. And I love difference. And we can fellowship and be one with each other. If he eats or not, but he gives thanks to God, hallelujah. If he celebrates a day or he doesn't like a Sabbath, and he does it to God, hallelujah. That he has a clear conscience and it's a faith and fully convinced in his own mind and it's out of love to the brotherhood. That is beautiful. <clears throat> and again, this is not commandments. It's conscience issues. Commandments, Matthew 18. We're, we're going to call each other to repentance. But conscience issues, we're going to receive one another. So here's the convicting part. The same word for received in verse 1 is the same word used in verse 3. Look at it. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has received him. God's accepted him. So what he's calling you to do is what he's done with you. God has received you completely and fully and brought you back to himself. That's the same word. I want you to receive one another fully, wholly, unconditionally, bring each other into this fellowship. God has accepted them. We're to receive them the same way God does. Show the same love and delight that the Lord does with his own. We're members of the same body. Can you imagine a family rejecting a handicapped child? 
We help each other with weaknesses and strengths. And so these issues are not the grounds that we admit you into church membership. I pray that we'll never drift to say, if you join this church, you can't dance. You can't smoke, dip, or chew, or go with girls who do. You can't play cards. You can only listen to Getty's music and dresses that don't touch your ankles and every tattoo's got to be covered up. It'll never be that. Those are, just, those are not the issues of the Christian faith. They're conscience issues that everyone's got to decide and do it unto the Lord why or what. But our call by God is to receive one another the way Jesus has received you with our differences on these issues. I pray that your hearts would get what Paul is saying here this morning. This breaks my heart. This is the mountain, and your most holy convictions are the molehills. And God's not going to say, boy" when you go breaking up the body of Christ and hurting people for these little molehills all of your days in the church. You need to get this. I know whole churches that are built on the molehills, and I refuse to ever be that kind of a church. That's your general principle. You like it? I love it. Second point, our first example in verse 2. <clears throat> One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. So what it says is you're going to be weak if you eat vegetables only. <laughs> Sorry, vegetarians, that was not nice. <clears throat> that was not nice. One man has faith that he can eat all things. Thank you, Jesus. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Thank you, Jesus, to please him in what he eats. So the issue here is, is eating meat or eating only herbs. And many thoughts as to maybe what was going on in the culture of Paul's day. When you shoot over to 1 Corinthians 8, I don't think it's the same thing, but I think it's a principle. <clears throat> Paul had addressed the Gentile problem. And the pagans, they, they would worship their idols and they would give meat offerings to these idols. And then the carcasses were not burned. And like any good entrepreneur, the priest then would go and sell this meat to the local vendors. And they would sell this meat in the market. And then there arose a big dispute in the church. If I go to a friend's house and he puts before me this discounted meat that was bought in the market, do I eat it or not? And one man says, no, it's polluted. I was given in worship of demons. I can't eat that meat. And the strong in faith goes, it's meat. Give God thanks past the pork or the ribs. <laughs> in Romans 14, 14, I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything is unclean, to him it is unclean. That's the struggle of what was going on in this church. Some would not eat meat. They weren't sure if it was kosher. Uh, that was most likely the issue. So that, that's what we're dealing with. That's our example. And I don't want to get lost in the example because the, the charge is what we need for us here this morning. So that's our third point is the charge. Look with me in verse 3. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats for God has accepted him. <clears throat> Here are the two main dangers. Are you ready? The strong regard with contempt the weaker, and then the weaker judges the stronger. That's the battle that has gone on for thousands of years. The strong, they, they regard with contempt. To, that Greek word means to view them as nothing or to look down upon them. You just kind of contempt, I'm looking down upon you because you can't eat meat. In Luke 18, 9, there was a parable of certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. They sneered at them. They looked down. The, the man said, look at me. I fast. I tithe. I pray. Not like that publican over there. I thank you, God. I'm not like him. I'm just so much more holier than him. And that's usually the mindset. Thank you, God, that I'm more holy than Jimmy Bob over here who can't do this. And some con commentators that I read think it was probably the love feast that this was going on, if you can get the picture. You got the strong, they're sitting there eating meat, and they're looking up from their roast pig, and they look at the vegetable-eating people, and they're like, they're clueless. They, they can't enjoy their freedom in Christ. One man said they are receiving all their food, but not their brethren. Don't look down smugly upon a child of God. That cannot be the spirit in which we deal with one another. Such a strong rebuke. 
thinking you are better, that you have your maturity to enjoy your freedom in Christ, and you just sit around condescending everyone else in your way. You will never get unity with that. The thinking, that thinking in spirit breeds disunity in the body of Christ. And what do the weak do? Well, the weak judge. He sees his brother eating the meat and he looks at the man and says, oh, antinomians. They've just broken down the bounds of God. God gave us these clean laws and look at them. There's no fear of God in their heart. At best, they're immature. And here's the famous one at worst. I just wonder if they even know Christ based on their eating of meat, not eating of meat. So the tendency is to sit in judgment upon others in this area as a sign of weakness, where you just sit around judging everybody else in these conscience issues. Uh, that's, that's weakness. It's the weak Christian that stands ready to pass judgment upon their souls. So let me help diagnose this. We have this weak brother. He's not clear he wants to make sure he's right, so he makes certain rules and lists and things that help him live his Christian life. And they're not content to just do that for themselves. They want everyone else to comply with their list in these areas. And they're so terrified that you will go wrong. You can't drink, you can't eat, you can't watch TV and all these things. And he judges himself and others in terms of these things alone. <clears throat> and they get lost in this. And so why should I not do this? It, it's true, isn't it? And Paul answers it perfect. God has accepted him. God has received him. The only one who is truly holy is the Godhead. I always love when someone says, I have the most holy way of doing something, and it's different than God's. And it, it, you're not more holy than God. Did I ruin your day? Don't, do, you, do you realize what you're saying? Whenever it comes to holiness, I always take the most holy path. Take God's path. I promise you that is the right path. And don't start getting built up where you, you think this. So God has received them. The only one who is truly holy is God. And the only one who truly knows the standard of righteousness is God. And you are pushing away one whom God has embraced. God has embraced them. And now you're putting him away. You're pronouncing judgment on one whom God has pronounced no condemnation. God has declared not guilty, justified. And now you're pushing that one away. You're saying your judgment is better than God's. Your standard is higher and more holy. I had a, a guy when we first started this church, and he told me that on every issue, I'm always going to choose the most holy way. And it was always these conscience issues that is going to cause strife right from the get-go. That is not how you're to think on this. You're rejecting him for whom Christ died. He's in union with Christ. He or she is loved. And one day this person is going to radiate like the noonday sun and God will see to it. So let our attitude reflect God's opinion toward him. God's embraced him. God has not made eating meat an issue of fellowship with this person. Do you get that? That has to knock you off your high horse this morning. Woe to us if we erect barriers that God has knocked down. Jesus said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. They tithe mint, every little thing in their garden, why they arrested and killed Jesus Christ. And I think we can be guilty of the same mindset in some of these areas with one another. And so I want you to consider God's role in verse 4. Who are you to judge the servant of another? The word servant, it's not the word doulos, it's a word for a house servant. It's one who had a close relationship to the master of the house. And this house servant <clears throat> is not accountable to the other servants. He doesn't run around going, I wonder what all the servants think. The only thing that matters is what does the master think? And so I want you to picture one of the servants coming up to this house servant and say, you know what? Your service is not what it should be. You're doing it wrong. You're a joke of a servant. You need to do it like me. 
And his response is, I only answer to my master. Whatever he wants is what I want to do. And the point is so simple is that you are a household slave of Christ. And Christ is the master. And I'm telling you, that is who you're going to have to answer to on the last day, not each other. And so every one of you are going to stand before this master on the last day, and you're going to give an account for what you approved or disapproved on conscience issues. And so it, it's not me judging and holding you accountable. It's every decision I make is in light of this Christ who I want to please as his servant. And I will give an account to that on the last day. That's weighty and that's heavy. And I want you to remove yourself from being that judge because this is the freedom and the beauty for the children of God. That's who we look to. Our model, our example, and our marching orders is Jesus Christ. Who are you to set the standard for everyone else on these issues? It's, Paul says, let it be your own conviction. <laughs> That's what will please your master, okay? Let it be your own conviction versus putting it on paper and proclaiming it and declaring it at every gathering. Stop. Why do you do that? Okay, let it be your own conviction. The reason you're telling everybody is you're not at peace with it. Get at peace with it so you don't have to put it on everybody else and tell everybody else. Well, if he doesn't adopt my standard, I think he's going to fall. That my standards are so right and good, I'm worried that you're going to fall from grace. So listen in verse 4 what God says. To his own master, he stands or falls, and I love this, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. This is the whole perseverance of the saints is the answer. They can stand without your holy standards. God can make them stand. I can, I can leave you to God and not be afraid you're going to fall because God will make you stand. Isn't that freedom? I don't have to worry that you're going to fall if you don't adopt my standard on conscience issues. I'm, I'm free to let you be free. Thank you, Jesus. Who are you to set the standard for everybody else on these issues? Let it be your own conviction. Receive one another. To his own master, he'll stand or fall. It is to Christ. He's our master and stand he will. Without my standard of convictions, he will not make shipwreck of his faith because the Lord is able to make him stand. Right back to Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jude one twenty four. now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling <clears throat> and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. God will cause us to stand. His power is greater than our convictions to make a brother or sister stand or fall. And if we doubt this power, we've got to make up man-made lists to hold each other up. If you don't trust God and his power, you start making all your lists and trying to keep everybody standing and yourself. Man, what a gospel. He can make you stand and stand you will. Oh, thank you, God, for your power to bring us on to glory. So the Lord has more concern and investment in this weaker brother than you will ever have. And for the sake of the communion table, the rest we're going to get to when I get there, when we preach through Romans. But I just want to read a little bit more <clears throat> to help you just get a flavor. Start in verse 5, and then we'll, we'll close this out. One person regards one day above another, and another regards every day alike. All these celebrations and holidays. It could have been the Sabbath for us. It could be Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter. I, I, I like Christmas because it brings them out all the time. There's people on both sides. It's a pagan holiday. You shouldn't do it. You should. And it just, it's so great because it stirs it up and it forces us to live this out. So I don't, you know, the, the trees, we try not to put ornaments and rub it in people's noses. We just want to celebrate the incarnation here at Southside. So everyone regards a day differently and each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. And he who observes the day, so whatever you choose on these days, he observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, he does it for the Lord. That's why he doesn't eat. And he gives thanks to God. Can't you rejoice in both people? They're both doing it to God. 
For not one of us lives for himself and not one of us dies for himself. This is huge. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. This is just all about, I'm God's. I live for his glory. All my choices are about his glory. And for this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and of the living. He, he's the Lord of lords. And verse 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the, we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. You're going to get judged by him. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And then he'll just keep flushing this out. But that's my bottom line is what we're going to look at at the table is Christ purchased us for him now to be the Lord of our lives. A savior to save us unto him being our Lord. And every decision we make on these conscience issues, as I look at them, and there's a grid in, in Romans 14 and 15 that I work through. But the, the bottom line is I just want to do it for the glory of God. And I don't want you to fall into legalism or licentiousness. And I want you to consider God. And then he's going to say in the rest of the chapter, will it stumble your brother? Will it hurt your brother? It's, it's these principles of love to God and love to the brotherhood that drive our decisions. And we all get the blessedness of being able to go before God and make these decisions on conscience issues and get convinced in our own heart and then live it and don't change it. So if you decide, hey, I can, I can have a glass of wine with dinner and, you, and you've studied it out and you've come to this point, there's not alcoholism, all these things, and you, you make that conviction and then someone else comes and judges you and you change it because you know, you're scared, he's saying, now that's sin. Once you have your conviction of how you should live before God and then you don't do it by pressures, and that's why he's saying don't try to force each other into changing. You might be hurting somebody. You might be getting them to change their conviction and now it's sin for them. And so give each other, don't hurt each other. Give each other room to have these differences and make their decisions before God and know that they're going to stand because God's able to make them stand. Isn't that beautiful? And what this will bring is a, a sweet unity where strong and weak are helping each other to not judge and not look down and to help each other become more like Christ because in the world, they never get this right. This is the only place where we can get it right. And we're going to show the world something so beautiful that we don't have to all look, act, and think the exact same. And we can have these differences on conscience issues, but have the one Lord, faith, hope, and be unified. And it's just nothing in the world is like this. I love being in the body of Christ. Such a blessing. So, may this not be a church that we all agree on non-essentials. That's my prayer. I don't want to all agree on these things. I want to agree how we deal with them. And these differences will teach us much more of Christ. And so may we build on this. God has accepted us in Christ Jesus. He's our Lord. He will cause us to stand or fall. And all, all that we do is unto him. And we're going to give an account on the last day for everything that we approve or disapprove. And everything that we should do should be done in love toward God and each other. And so a healthy church talks about non-essentials. They're important. But the flavor is that this church is about the big things that Paul brought up. Salvation and sovereign grace that will make us stand. And that will build the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that we welcome one another and that we receive one another so that this body may be built up into its head and that the world would see a unity in our disunity and want to know the hope that we have within us of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. And why this passage on Communion Sunday then? As the last time I was here, when I did communion before sabbatical, I, I preached on 1 Corinthians 11. And there were divisions going on in the body and they were viewing each other with contempt and judging and not loving one another and eating while the poor had nothing. And there was just a real disregard for each other in the celebrating of one of the most beautiful things ever, the sacrificial death of Christ. And so Paul calls them to an examination to, to consider how am I treating each other in the body of Christ? Am I forgiving? Am I harboring bitterness? And then in this, this morning, am I, am I judging you? 
Am I condemning? Am I looking on you with contempt on these conscience issues? Is there just this lack of forgiveness in my heart? And so we come and we look at these elements and Paul wants us to examine and say, where am I? Am I cold and distant? I just, I really don't care about the body of Christ. I come and leave. Those, these are things that need to be dealt with and repented at the communion table to see the beauty of the body of Christ and am I giving myself to it the way Christ has called me to? Am I loving it and caring and treating it in the way that I should? Am I keeping the unity of the Spirit or bearing all my grudges and stirring up strife and conflicts? This is, the, this is what I love at the communion table. Is it's, it's a time to repent to God and, and to each other for how we've treated each other or thought in our hearts or some of these issues. So this is a beautiful thing. The table is a big thing that unifies us in Christ. And so God wants us to keep this unity. And so have you been living in accord with the glorious gospel? Are you doing these sins that we just looked at? The table is the time to remember Christ and to look at our hearts in regard to God. Am I leaving sin unchecked or not repented of? This is a table for sinners. <laughs> I love it. But it's, it's a table for repenting sinners and believing sinners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is a great time to examine and to look at our hearts uh, and how we're dealing with God and the body. And then we're going to come together in unity and oneness, shoulder to shoulder, by faith, looking at this Christ together. What a glorious ordinance that God has given to the church of God. So let's take some time and examine and look our eyes out at Jesus Christ for forgiveness and power to live the way that he lived. So let's go to him and, and pray. Father, I come before you. Lord, I thank you for the glorious passage that's before us. Without your wisdom and your spirit and this inspired word, we would get this wrong every time. Like the world, they, they can't figure this out. And they, they try, visualize world peace and they try everything they can to get unity and we're, we're more disunified than we've ever been as a country. And oh God, how we need the church of God today to let people walk in from this disunified country and to walk in and see unity from people with all walks of life and people who don't dress and talk and act the same, but a people that all love Jesus Christ with a passion and have made him Lord of Lord and King of Kings in their heart. They've bowed their knee. They just want his glory. Oh God, what a beautiful thing that unifies us. And so I pray, Lord, that we would repent of these wrong spirits, the judging and the looking with contempt. Father, to trust our brothers and sisters to have this freedom of conscience with you and that you're the one who's going to judge them on these issues and we don't need to. So God, bring healing and beauty and oneness in the body of Christ. Any unforgiveness or sins that need to be repented of, God, I pray that that would be done even now during the time of examination. God, we thank you for the beauty of what we have in Christ and in the body of Christ. Let us now enjoy this ordinance to the fullest. And it's in that precious and sweet name that we do pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.